So what we'll do is, for some of you who aren't here all the time, we'll introduce ourselves, and then um, we'll just take it away. I'm Jeanette White. I'm from Wyndham Senate District. I'm Anthony Polino from Washington County. Brian Collimore, the Rutland District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. All right. You can see we're all from someplace a little different, some counties, some districts, some county districts, and some <laughs> Senate districts. So. But we're all senators. We have that in common. <laughs> yes. So, Mike, you are going to um, come join us, please. Um, talk to us about the issue of public records through DMV. And um, I don't know if everybody else knows you, so you'll have to introduce yourself before you start. But the, um, we asked Mike to come and talk about um, a couple things, what their policy is around public records. And then there's been this big um, flap about uh, selling the information. And um, there are some. And, and I know that there are some discretionary people that you can give it to. And um, I have heard loud and clear from a couple professions, primarily uh, private investigators, who feel that their access is going to be cut off. So if you would, those are kind of the where, where we are. We have to leave that yeah. to the so Thank you. For the record, my name is Michael Smith, Director of Operations for the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, what you just laid out is a little different than what was told to me when I was asked to come over. It was more just to give an overview of the Driver Privacy yeah. Protection Act and but I can talk a little bit about some of the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's kind of what I was okay. <laughs> I, I just curious. didn't put it very artfully. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, um, and I know that you were given some uh, FAQs on the Driver Privacy Protection Act. I see that some of you haven't. I get a little overview that I'm going to kind of speak from and then we'll move right into it. Mm -hmm. So in 1994, Congress enacted the Driver Privacy Protection Act. Um, it was to protect personal information contained in individuals' motor vehicle records. Um, DPPA, Driver Privacy Protection Act, does allow for release of personal information in certain circumstances. Um, it, it, it requires it in some and allows it in others. So it's, it's required that we release it in regards to vehicle safety, vehicle theft or emissions, market research, and I'll quantify that one here in a little minute, um, protects product recalls and court proceedings. Um, those agencies with access to personal information for these purposes are law enforcement agencies, insurance companies, motor vehicle dealers, uh, businesses, employers to verify personal information for employment, towing companies to notify owners of towed vehicles, and private detectives and security agencies. During the 1999 session, Congress amended the Driver Privacy Protection Act, um, and they, um, under this amendment, amendment states can cannot release personal information on motor vehicle records to sales and marketing organizations and the general public unless the individual whose information that is has specifically opted in to allow that. Um, motor vehicles does not have the capability in our computer system to track who opted in, who opted out, so we opted not to do that. So we do not do, we do not partake in that activity. Uh, in, 19, in the 1999 amendment, it did specify specific personal information that is highly restricted. That includes photographs, digital images, social security numbers, medical and disability information. So that information is not released. Um, there's a couple other Vermont statutes that kind of lay over the top of it, because you've got, I like to think of it as the Driver Privacy Protection Act is the umbrella, and then you've got some state statutes that are underneath it. Um, can I ask you a question? You certainly can. That's very interesting that you get you can give the address but not the zip code. Well, you can give the zip code, not the address. But I think it's okay. I see. Zip oh, oh, I see. Yes. I see. I was reading it backwards. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry. No, that's quite that's <laughs> right. um, So the relevant statutes: Vermont Title 23, Section 104, the Public Records Act, or Section of Title 23, and 23, Section 114, which talks about the fees that are charged for the specific information. So driving records have a charge. If you wanted a certified copy of a registration application or something along those lines, title searches, um, stuff like that. That's all included in that. Now, 
<coughs> excuse me, and, and now I'm moving into the, the FAQs which were submitted to, to everybody, so you have those in front of you. And again, this talks about what the Driver Privacy Protection Act is, what is personal information, and personal information is identified as photograph, social security number, driver's identification number, name and address, but not the five digits of code, telephone numbers, medical or disability information, um, but it does not include information on vehicular accidents, driving violations, and driving status. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot of and I'd like to dispel right now is, I'm sure everybody is getting phone calls saying that your warranty is running out. We do not store phone numbers. We do not provide phone numbers. Um, how these individuals are reaching out in regards to your warranty running out is not coming from motor vehicles. My 12-year-old daughter gets those calls too and she does not have a car. <laughs> and won't ever if I can handle it. <laughs> so, um, so has Vermont complied with the Driver Privacy Protection Act? Yes, we have. Um, Vermont public records laws and how does the DPPA in fact impact Vermont statutes? And you know, as I alluded to before, while Vermont's public records law keeps the most at records open for public inspection, DPPA lays over the top of it and that provides some additional restrictions. Um, are there instances when personal information must be released under the Driver Privacy Protection Act? Yes, I talked a little bit about that before, and that is driver safety, theft, motor vehicle emissions, motor vehicle product alterations, recalls. I'm sure you've all, if you, you bought a car, you probably got one of those letters in the mail that says that you know there's something wrong with the vehicle and the dealer needs to check it out. You may not have purchased that vehicle brand new, so through our providing this information, the manufacturers are able to track down that while the dealer has you as buying it, you may now possess the vehicle and you need to know about that safety recall. Um, I'm sorry to keep sniffing, but I'm sorry to come down with a cold. Um, so are there exceptions when personal information may be released? Yes, there is. Um, there's several agents. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, there's several agencies and organizations that may obtain personal information regardless of the DPPA protections. Law enforcement agencies, federal government, state agencies may receive personal information from DMV records. However, personal information will not be released to any of the following individuals or agencies unless they filed an affirmation statement with the DMV asserting that they are entitled to the personal information under DPPA. So and, and a lot of these are the organizations that I've already talked about, conducting vehicle recalls, insurance companies, um, parties involved in federal or state course case, case arbitrations, including attorneys, towing companies, employers for verification. In the CDL world, um, drive, employers are required to have a driver qualification file. When the federal government comes in and audits them, they are required to have a certified copy of the individual's driving record in that file. This is used to determine that they have a valid license, that it is properly endorsed for whatever they are driving. Um, most notably, school bus drivers are required to provide these to their employers so that we know that they're, they're safe drivers. Um, why would DMV share personal information if they aren't required to? There's many reasons that it's beneficial for consumers for DMV to share this, this information. Manufacturers that we talked about, so they can contact you to rate, so for insurance companies, as they are doing their underwriting to determine what the rates are based on your driving history. Um, it allows employers to do background checks, which I alluded to. Um, how do, how do we share it? So there's, there's three different ways. So there's the paper search. There's a form that you would fill out. It's our record request form. You fill it out indicating what it is that you want as the fees that are associated with whatever service it is that you're looking to obtain. Um, and then the, on the back of it, it has all of the various reasons under the Driver Privacy Protection Act that would qualify you for that information. If I am looking for your information and you have signed the form allowing me to have it, then I am eligible for that information and you will provide it because you have given me the release to give it. That is generally what happens in the employer-employee situation. Um, bulk data transfers, um, and this is with companies like BIC, the Mine Information Consortium, so we provide the data. Insurance companies will then purchase that data to, to determine that you have a valid license, such as you know, set your policy rates and stuff like that. Um, then there's over-the-counter requests, and that's where I talked about when you're showing up and looking for your driving record or a copy of your 
registration application. I'm not sure why I did that, but if I needed that, then um, we would sell that over the counter, provided you either comply with PPPA or I have your authority to handle that um, or to provide that. Um, what does DMV share? Uh, we share vehicle information, which would be make, model, year, VIN number, the address so that the manufacturer can contact you to provide the vehicle recall information. Um, in the situation of driving records, um, it is your name. The driving records that we produce do not have the address on them, but they do include any convictions or violations that you might have and the status of your license, whether it's valid or not, as well as endorsements and restrictions. So one of the things that we're doing with, with all of this, um, you know, kind of coming up, we're sitting back and we're looking at what are the, the areas of the Driver Privacy Protection Act that are a may, if you will. So the shalls are pretty specific. We, we shall provide this information. But then there's a various list of ones that we may provide. And what we are doing at this point is looking at what ones are those because it is a may. It does not mean that we have to. So um, we're amending Vermont statutes to clarify potential ambiguities regarding when DMV is required to share this information. That's actually in our miscellaneous bill this year. Um, we have terminated the use of the terminals, which we had in the Burlington office and the Montpelier office, which was to allow private eyes to come in and look up information on their own. Now, we have not denied them information. We've denied them access to the terminals, so they are not able to look them up themselves. They're actually visiting a counter, and we are vetting the information that they have. If they are in working for a court or for a lawyer, for a court case, and have the documentation showing that they are you know, contracted with and researching for this lawyer or this court situation, then we're moving forward and providing information. I do want to clarify the social security number, photos, medical information is never provided. Um, and we are completing a comprehensive re review of disclosures that are permitted. I reference that there's 12 different variations that are on there. One of them is for notifying um, like lien holders and owners of towed vehicles. Um, in that situation, we actually have a, a, a process in place, which is for abandoned vehicles, which, which does that notification. So we may look at that one and say, you know, at this point in time, we don't want to exercise the authority to use that because there's another avenue for that information to be released. Uh, we're modifying the applications used to request information and, and creating an annual certification process for those individuals that routinely come and access our data. Mark, do you have an <clears throat> estimate how many people have I assume the form that you're talking about, which would allow you to, mm -hmm. it is one that someone has to request. I mean, it, it's not an opt-out or opt-in situation. You've got to actually request it, sign it. Mm -hmm. Do you have an idea how many people have done that? I do not, no. no. The form is available on our website, you okay. know, and, and it's used for various different reasons. So uh, I, I don't have with me today to be able to speak to that. And once the person does that, is that good forever, or can they request it? So it's interesting. So we had a database, and this was in the news, and, and we named it the DPPA Frequent User Database. Now, one would hear that name and think these are all individuals that frequently come into DMV. We should have chosen a different name. Okay, so this was a total accumulation of everybody and anybody who had filled out one of the forms, not just an individual record, but had asked for access to look at the data. So all, I think there were 700 names that were listed in that. All 700 names are not coming in. In that data was Welland Police Department. Way, way back when, they did not have access to look up information from the cruisers through the message switch. So they had an agreement with DMV. In our files, we actually have a letter from them saying, well, we don't need this access anymore because we're coming through DPS. We didn't go and take them out of the database, so they're still in there. So part of what we're doing is working down through this database to request from the individuals that are in there, do you still need it? And here is our form, fill it out so that we can re-vet and determine whether you qualify for it and whether we're going to provide that information. Thank you. Uh, so I have a couple questions. I, I understood your question to be slightly different. And I, I had a question that I thought you were asking. Is if there, there are people who can 
opt in to have their information shared. Is that what you said? So Individuals, I could I could say yes, you can share my information. We do not have the we do not have the capability. So you're not to store doing it, that. So we are not doing Great. That. Okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Because in the amendment in 1999, originally DPPA said we could share information for market research and stuff like that. In the 1999 amendment, Congress amended that to say that the only way DMVs can do that is if you have an opt-in from the person whose information that is. Our problem is being able to store that data. I'm sure you've all heard about our computer system. It's a little antiquated. It's actually even older than I am. Um, but at this point, we, we don't have that ability, so we decided we would not share data for those purposes. So who, I have a couple questions. Who makes the decision on the permissive um, people that, I mean, there are the ones you're required to share with and then there's mm -hmm. the permissive. Who makes that decision? So our, our process was the, the application would come into the department, it would be shared with our attorney, and we had an assistant attorney general assigned to DMV. We're kind of in flux right now because he retired. Um, and we have another one coming on board. So that it will be shared through the attorneys to look at it, to determine does the individual qualify, then it would come to the commissioner for sign off. Yeah, but isn't there a group of people that are permissive that you, I mean a category of people that, I, I understood there was a category of people that, there's categories of people that you are required to share with like law enforcement and stuff. And then there's categories of people or, companies or whatever that you, you can choose to or not. And do you do that on an individual basis or do you, who makes the decision to include that category in your will share or won't show? So share. I may have been a little misleading. It's not categories of people, it's it's categories of reasons. So oh. there's bless you, there's twelve different reasons that people would have access or be able to obtain this information. Some are mandatory, some are permissive as you said. So um, like one of the ones, ones on here, so for formal use, for use in the formal course of business by a legit, legitimate business or its agents, employees, or contractors to verify accuracy of personal information submitted. So that could be an employer. You've just hired me to drive for you. So you're looking for verification that I have a driver's license, part of your legit, legitimate business need. Um, for use in connection with operation of private toll transportation facilities. So in that situation, we would have to look at the toll situation, determine whether they're legitimate, like Easy Pass and stuff like that, to be able to share that information. Each one is, is different, so we would have to vet them individually. And then I have one more question, then I'll, I'm sure other committee members have questions also, but I have one more. When, um, when the, uh, my understanding is that when we win a case through the Attorney General's office, and there's money that accrues to the state that they, um, I suppose, reasonably deduct their their expenses and what went into it to to gain, get that. But the leftover money goes into the general fund, and I believe that's right that the. AG's office keeps some of it and then the rest goes in. Am I right? <laughs> well, I thought I was hiding behind you. <laughs> I, I think that's right. I don't, I don't know for sure. And um, because I know there was a big uh, discussion about what we should do with the uh, VW settlement money. And, and so what do you do with, if you're selling, how do you, first of all, how do you establish the fees that you're going to charge? And then clearly you're generating more income than the expense to to generate the the information and do you does dmv keep that does it go to aot or does it come to the general fund that shows in the transportation fund it goes into the transportation <laughs> correct. Fund. Correct. correct well i said <laughs> yes. oh that yes. i meant aot yeah, yeah so i mean the department does not keep any of the revenue that's generated uh, the revenue that we collect is authorized in 23 vsa 114 um, that is a statute that was created and it's been modified over the years and it establishes the fees that the department will charge for the data that it sells. All right, who else has? So are, are we, I don't know, okay, go ahead. No, I just, you know, you have in the, uh, under your uh, question list, 
in the third bullet it says a person specifically agrees to make the information public. So, and you are, I believe you're telling us that they, that really, that, that opportunity doesn't exist, that people can't opt in, you can't keep those records. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so wondering how they could do this inadvertently isn't really an issue because they can't do this right now. Got it. And on your list of the ways you're going to improve your data sharing practices, um, I'm just curious, um, are you making progress on this? And I assume some of this is in the DMV bill. Um, and uh, oh, I don't know what my real question, I, I don't really know where additionally I was, I, get, I think that uh, the chair asked my primary question on this. I just am curious, you can do so much of this on your own I know you're wanting to amend the statutes from with the Mays, but the rest of this, most of this, you can do on your own, right? Right. right. And, we will and when are we hoping to see progress on this? When are we hoping that you will actually have completed and improved? I, I don't have a specific. Your, sorry, sorry. No, no. I'm just. No, I just love a, dead, a, a notion of your right, timeline on right. that. So um, I don't have an actual timeline of it. We have a group that the commissioners put together that's sitting down, and we're looking at all of the various reasons that are, are available. We've compiled that data at this point in time, um, and now it's the process of sitting down and going through and determining what may, this sounds weird, what mays we shall <laughs> give, right. if you understand what I mean. And then from there, we will then start breaking it down. We're looking at the database and trying to create a mail merge to go out to all the individuals that are on there to say, this has been ended, and here's a form, please complete it. And and let us know why it is you believe that you still qualify for this information, and then a vetting process will have to occur. I guess my last question is, in terms of the amount of money, the $15 million that you generated uh, in selling data uh, and selling public records, or they're not really public records because they're private. Right. So we don't, are, they aren't really part of our public record. It's interesting that you say that because last year we modified the statute because I believe 104 used to say that everything that the Department of Motor Vehicles was open to public inspection during normal business hours. But, but not, then DPPA laid over the top of it and started adding and so we amended the statute last year to remove the part that spoke about all of our records being public because they're not. Uh, and then the statute was modified so that it said DMV shall comply with DPPA. So there is a concern that by saying we shall comply, we shall give all the information. So we're looking to have it changed to say that we may, so that it doesn't have the ship. The you can't have contradictory shall. Yes, exactly. Got that. Exactly. Um, okay. So part of your records are public records, and part of your records are not public records. Correct. Correct. Got it. And then you've got the the public or personal, uh, personally identifiable information that lays on top of that because your VIN number is not personally identifiable information. In many ways, just your name by itself isn't personally identifiable information. Your name and your date of birth, now we're in a whole different story. So um, one of our debate, I mean our discussion in public records is, is, uh, is cost whether the state absorbs that cost as a part of doing business or whether we charge for it. So for for-profit companies that are asking for our public records, like an insurance company, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's sort of a different kettle of fish than the public asking for something, than the press asking, or an individual. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you have a, do you civet in terms of the cost to the requester by whether or not they, who they are? No. I mean, so do insurance companies pay, but a private individual doesn't? So if you I, want, I don't know. How I'm not a private individual. Right. They, well, I mean, they wouldn't even qualify. Right. So let's say I wanted to buy well, your, if I wanted to buy your driving record, right? So in statute right now it says that if I can identify you, I can buy your driving record. So, and and it qualifies it in statute by saying that you must have your name and your date of birth. If I have your name and your date of birth, I can buy your driving record. Part of what I talked about in the beginning is driving record, driving status is not <coughs> personal information. Right. So that is eligible to be put out there. Our driving records do have your name and date of birth on them, but in that instance, I'm giving you back exactly what you gave me. And if I can't look up your name and your date of birth to say, hey, this is you, then I deny your request because you haven't given me specific information. Did that make sense? So could I have her, could I go in and say, I want 
Allison Clark's Clarkson's <coughs> driving <coughs> record, excuse me, and I have her date of birth. Yeah. And you would I give would it to you, me. I would have you fill out the Driver Privacy Protection Act record request form. And if you can provide the date elements, name and date of birth, and they match on the system, I will sell you her driving. But record. that's anybody on Facebook or anybody who looked at our old legislative bios would exactly. have all our dates of birth. Exactly. Right? That is nobody special. That's just. Right. And at the end of the day, the information that would be provided back would be one, your name and date of birth, because you just gave that to me. So I'm not releasing anything that oh. you didn't already give me. And then your driving record information. So accidents, convictions is not personal information. It's not covered by, by DPPA, so hmm. it is available to be released. So, Anthony? Well, I guess I need to be reminded, how did you generate the $12 million? Fifteen. Fifteen. So, fifteen, where I believe that, that was over four years. So, where did it fit into these? So, the dri driving records, a three-year driving record is $14. So anybody who purchases a driving record would collect $14. If you're an insurance company and you're accessing through either a data aggregator or through Vermont Information Consortium, you are paying the statutory fee. And then the statutory fee is sent to DMV and DMV puts it into the transportation fund. But I didn't, I didn't have to have the birth dates or anything like that. What do you mean? To, to make the request to access that information that you generated the $15 million for. Right. But it, your driving records, we do. Okay. Because you've given that to your insurance company, and your insurance company is then using that to access through these other companies to get your information. Right. So the insurance company says to DMV, we have all this information. That's the right. trigger to let DMV right. sell you their information. Right. So um, when you're required to <laughs> remind me the non driver ID, okay. I still have a little green driver. The privilege license. card, you mean? Yeah, the non-driver ID. Oh, the non-driver ID. Which is different than what? Right, right, which is different from a privilege card. So there's a non-driver ID, and then there's the driver privilege card, which I guess is what I have, but it's green mm -hmm. and has no picture on it. So you have one of the old green non -photo. Looks like it came out of a Cracker Jack box. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I love using that in different states. <laughs> um, but they do not, none of those have citizenship on them, right? DMV does not store citizenship information in our databases. We do ask it on the application because it's needed in the issuance of a real ID driver's license. So again, in, for clarity, it is not keyed into our system. It is not stored in our computer system. It is stored on paper and then an imaged copy, period. And only for the real ID, not for the privilege right. card. Correct. Or for the non-driver card. So, okay, so Non, so let me clarify here. So there is a non-driver ID that's real ID. There's a non-driver ID that's a privilege card. Yeah. Okay, so two different situations. Real ID, we are storing that information because you have to answer that question um, yeah. on a privilege card, either a privilege card driver's license or privilege card non-driver. That question does not apply and it says right on the form, unless you're registering to vote, you don't have to answer that question. So when, um, when you're required to give to federal and state agencies and law enforcement agencies, does that include ICE? I believe... Yes, it's a federal one. See, I would say yes. I think they have access to the same thing that law enforcement has coming through the message switch at the state police. But they would, would they have to have a, a reason for asking for it the same as anybody else? I mean, yes. any of these people that ask have to have a reason yes. for asking. And so. Yes. And again, we don't store the citizenship information on the system, so that is not information that they are accessing. So does law enforcement, because I said is uh, law enforcement, obviously, um, do, do they need uh, identifying information to access that tri triggers your ability to, to share it with them? How much personal information do they need, like an insurance company? Right, so How much so do they need for, to, right, to trigger that release? It's the same from law, from law enforcement, because they're all going to be kind of grouped the same. So, it, I mean, if they're, they're interacting with you, let's say, at the border, right? So you've given them your driver's license, and they're going to access your driving record. I don't know why they would, but they, they probably have access through the computer system to look at your driving record to determine whether it's valid or not, right? Um, so, but they don't have access to the forms. Right? The forms are what has the citizenship information. I don't know if I answered your question. Um, 
I don't know if you've answered it either. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just curious how much information ICE has to have to trigger your releasing information to them. How much does law enforcement have to give you to so let you know that A, they're legit right. and not a scammer? Right. So and they would be coming through DPS's Department of Public Safety's message switch. Their agreement would be with Department of Public Safety, not with DMV. Right? So law enforcement goes through that message switch. So there's a filter already by the time they're requesting from you? Correct. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, if they're running your license plate number, well, there's the data that they're using to figure out who, whose car it belongs to. If they have a license number, they're running the license number to find out that it matches the person that, that gave it to them. I mean, it's, um, it's hard to answer your, your question without those specifics behind it. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions of Mike? Mm -hmm. And I know you're going to be doing the same thing in transportation, but uh, Senator Mazza said we should just talk to you in um, <coughs> as it relates to the public records. Yeah. So, um, any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Good start. I'm sort of it's getting all the. Um, well, you could sell that space. Let's see to the highest bidder. That's public access to a public. Um, let's see. I have. Well, Tucker, we're not going. You don't need to testify. But I have Anne Galloway on here, but I don't see her. And then I have Mark Davis. Maybe Colin's testifying. Yeah, no, I'm not covering. I think both uh, Matt and Mark are here to testify. Okay. Somebody switch on the lights that's right next to the door there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so who, so on the list here, and is there anybody that isn't on the list that wants to testify today? I have Ann Galloway, and you said um, she's not going to. Mark and Matt, and Matt Roy. Roy. Yeah, we're here. Mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I, oh, you're, are you Matt? Matt okay. I'm Mark. Hello. Yep, I, rec <laughs> I recognize you down there. <laughs> I can't even see you. You, yeah. you were very <laughs> instrumental in when we did the shield yes. bill. Yes. <clears throat> um, and Jay Barton? He's coming. Okay. And Scott Woodard, I don't see him. Scott is not here yet. Okay. And is there anybody else that, that clearly this is not the only time we're going to do this, but is there anybody else here who wants to testify, get on the list today if we have time. I see the Deputy Commissioner is quickly running out of the room. I don't think you need me. Okay, thank you. We always need you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, Mark? Yes. Oh, thanks. We have to do Call me the, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Davis, I'm the Assistant News Director at Vermont Public Radio. Uh, here on behalf of my organization, along with the Vermont Journalism Alliance, which includes Vermont Digger, WCAX, uh, Seven Days, and some other media organizations. I, I don't want to get in the weeds too much. I know you guys are early days in this, but. Well, we're, it's not too early. We want to get in the weeds as much as possible sure. because we want to get as much information as we can as we right. begin to put ideas into here. And Tucker is here keeping all those yes. ideas um, for us. So, um, and and I understand. I think it's important to to say that, and you might have been going to say this anyway. That the the people who are because this is an issue that involves the press and the media or media, I guess it, that the people who are testifying are not the people who are going to be reporting. That that was made pretty clear to me that that it, there was this kind of separation that was figured out somehow. So yeah, and I think it's for our organizations to figure out. It's certainly you yeah. know, an uncomfortable position for us to do, which is why we don't do it very often. It's also somewhat unusual for organizations like Digger and Seven Days and WCX and VPR to, to work together. I hope you take it as a measure of just how important mm -hmm. we, we believe this is. Uh, I think it's probably worth starting with a rather obvious point that often gets overlooked. And that is, when we're talking about public records, we are talking about records that do not belong to the government, they don't belong to the bureaucrats, they don't belong to the agencies, they don't even belong to you guys. They belong to the people. And so when we're talking about charging for public records, what we are talking about effectively is for employees who are paid by the people 
seeking more money from people to access their own records. Um, I think that gets lost. This conversation so often becomes about the, the convenience of the state government, of agencies, complaints that various employees have. These records belong to the people of Vermont. I, I think that needs to be very much uh, on your minds as you go forward in this. Um, I, I think we find that while sometimes the process works well, I think anyone who's been in the media at all knows that oftentimes fees and exemptions are used as obstruction, <laughs> as tools to prevent us from doing our jobs, from preventing us from telling the people what the government's been up to. You'll probably hear a lot of examples uh, as time goes on. I can give you a very recent one from uh, Vermont Public Radio. Uh, we asked for records of a fatal police shooting. You can't imagine a more severe government action than a government agent taking someone's life and then the government declaring that to be a lawful act. So we asked to see the file. What happened in this case? Was it reasonable to declare it lawful or not? You know, we don't know. Uh, the, the assessment came back at $3,000. <laughs> to look at records, this case is closed. This place has been well publicized. 3000 bucks for our organization to to do, I think, work that you would hopefully agree is vital. There's plenty more where that came from. We have one a year ago where we looked, asked to look at a file uh, involving a high-profile case involving a former lawmaker who used to work in this building. Uh, criminal charges were not pursued in a matter involving this lawmaker. Uh, again, uh, more than $1,000 was requested to look at the file. One really fun example that they wanted to charge us for fees, there was many, many hours that they asked to review and redact the documents. We bump into this one a lot. The Attorney General's office asked for, I believe it was at least 24 hours of staff time to redact documents. Again, a high profile, closed case. Sort of inquired why, why do you need so much time to redact these documents? The answer came back from the Attorney General's office that the attorneys who do the review for the exemptions uh, were incapable of using the software that could also redact the information and so they wanted us to pay for attorneys to review it, and then for someone in the secretary's office, apparently, who knew how to use the software to go ahead and implement. Now, this might sound small, but this is a, probably a daily occurrence for those of us in media. We see over and over and over again the government invoking fees, invoking exemptions to keep records from the public. Um, I, I think you'll probably hear more about this, certainly the EB-5 case, certainly the prison case that seven days broke. Those are massive examples. There's examples that happen every day. Um, and so we certainly were uh, supported the Supreme Court decision that said you know, inspecting public records is free. We think that's obvious. <laughs> we don't understand what the controversy could possibly be about the government giving records to the people. Um, and any efforts to roll that back uh, are alarming. I think at the end of the day, you cannot have democracy without accountability, and you can't have accountability without providing records, without openness, without transparency. I, I, it'd be nice to live in a world where the government just put these records out on the website. I'm not even sure why we have to ask for them all the time, why we have to pursue them, why we have to hector government employees, why we have to pay so much money. I think it would make sense for the government just to put this information out. Uh, of course, that never happens. Uh, if you're going to make us do that work for you, <laughs> uh, I don't think you have a right to charge us for it and to continuously try to gouge us for it. We see that more often than not. That, I'd be happy to address any specific questions. So I just I I understand that. Mm -hmm. In terms of just putting the putting records out, mm -hmm. um, if if there is a if personal information is in a record, do you think that ought to be available? I mean, again, they always come into the particulars. I mean, There's I'm almost just, 200 exemptions to this law. 263, I think. I think one could safely ponder whether there is such thing as a law that has 200 some exemptions to it. I don't know if I would even declare it a law at this point. Um, no, but frankly, that's not something that takes a lot of time to do. This is 2020. There's, you know, we always hear about bad records management, bad yeah. software. That shouldn't be left to the people to pay for. That's that's the government's fault. Um, I think part of working for the government is providing <laughs> records for the people. This should not be a controversial idea. Um, that's the cost of doing business and working for government. And I do. I I know there's 263 or 73 exemptions, and you know we we went through each one yeah. about three years ago or four years ago, and and um, the decision was that we could have 10 really broad exemptions, or we could have 263 very specific exemptions, and that was the decision that 
we made because um, if you had 10 really broad ones. And of course, it often comes down to how you choose to interpret those exemptions, how the government chooses to interpret those exemptions. And certainly, I think there are agencies that do it more responsibly yeah. than others. Um, but more often than not, you lean towards interpreting it in the most rigid way possible to make it as difficult as possible for us to obtain the information. So, <clears throat> Mark, you've dealt with many departments, many agencies, yeah. many aspects and branches of state government. Yeah. Which have you found is the best model? I think it, I think it ebbs and flows uh, with time. It, it depends on different personnel. I hesitate to single anyone out. I will say I think you've seen this recently flare up with the Attorney General's office in the state where I think uh, us and a lot of other outlets are, are having some issues and we're butting heads. And certainly I think that is the place that is generating the most concern in the media at this time. Yeah, I understand what your concern is. I'm just curious, what's our best, <clears throat> what are people's best experiences? And what might we model? Because what we've heard is everybody sort of seems to uh, store their data, you know, uh, process their data as it comes in, figure out how to store it and chronicle it. And it, it strikes me that so far we've heard that the best example is Tanya's, that we have, uh, that Tanya's archives has, has a very good model. And I'm just wondering, do we, it sounds like that's our best model that we could figure out how to roll out through every branch of state government so that everybody was doing the same, you know, storing it and making it accessible in the same fashion. I apologize. I haven't given that exact question in a lot of thought, and I'm loath to sort of shoot from okay, the hip. But we'd appreciate it, actually we the answer and, and get back what, that, yeah. what are the best ones, what work, you know, what work. No, I, yeah, most we, can, successfully. we can look into that more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether when you make a request and they come up with these thousands of dollars of cost, do they make it clear whether it's been for the redaction, the, the gathering of the information, your viewing of it, your copying of it? I mean, we've heard different things about what people get charged for. I'm just wondering if you could yeah. speak to that at all. Again, it really is all over the map. It, it varies. I will tell you, I, you know, it's certainly with some recent ones, the Attorney General's office will get at least some itemized X amount of hours for redaction, for example. Um, and then oftentimes we can call and, and press for more information. Some places we just get a blanket, here's your cost, and then we follow up. Uh, it's a it's scattershot, as is sort of most things when it comes to public records. Interesting. It just seems like it shouldn't be that way. So most state employees, I assume, have job descriptions and are focused on if it's a 40-hour week doing certain things during that week. Can you imagine a situation where if there were more than one organization or person coming in to request, where there would be a, reason, a reasonable person might say, well, that would take an inordinate amount of time, and, and you're either going to have to wait a little bit longer to get what you're asking, or we're going to have to bring somebody in and pay them to do it who might be doing something else otherwise. That's probably not a... No, I, I hear what you're getting okay. at. Okay. I, I think I could probably imagine such a scenario. Uh, what I would say is I don't think we've seen evidence sort of supporting that. I mean, we hear that a lot, right? These sort of nightmare scenarios of people coming in and paralyzing agencies, essentially. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of actual proof of that. I mean, I think we can all give you dozens of concrete examples of the other extreme. So yes, could I imagine it? Yes, but I, I don't see it happening um, in any significant way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think that our uh, archivist is trying to work with um, different departments and agencies. Do you know our archivist? Oh, you should. Tanya Marshall, right there, you should. <laughs> For the record, Tanya Marshall, uh, state archivist. I do want to add, though, that this committee and the House of Ops, we have the statewide records and information right. program. It is expected for public agencies, whether or not they engage to make that better. But, you know, I'm an information management specialist by background. That's our goal. Um, but I really feel that it becomes the legislature's kind of duty to maybe help us oh, yeah. engage more agencies in a program to actually follow that. Yeah. Well, yeah. We can tell them they have to. <laughs> Well, it, that was my takeaway from the other day, is that you have seem to have a model that works well. You have a system that you've designed that manages records as they come in uh, and makes them fairly accessible for, for the, the public. Records, yes, for the records in our custody, we take 
custody of records from all three branches of state government, so we do manage them in a certain way to make sure they're accessible, but we also oversee the statewide records and information management program that's covering everybody. Um, and that's where we don't always see that the agency departments have the right tools, the systems are right. working, and so forth. Yes. But that was my Yeah, I don't get a lot of complaints about our reference <laughs> room when people come and ask for records, and, and we do, we, we process a lot of public records requests. On a, and your basis. point is well taken that we need to be more um, insistent that agencies and departments <laughs> here, here. do here. more opportunity yeah. for everybody. Yes, I drank it. I did have another question yeah. for you, but you know, now I've Sorry, I made well, her quick, quick, forget. Oh, okay, good. I mean, I just wonder, you must talk with your comrades in other states. I'm just wondering, we obviously don't do a very good job here. Um, just wondering, do you hear what's going on in other states? You, similar uh, dilemmas? A, a little bit. I think Matt, who says fine Max has more experience in other states. I, I know that Florida has long been, uh, been held up as a place that has a very good sun, sunshine law. I've never, I've been a journalist in Vermont too long to, right. to more. Um, yeah, I don't think we're doing well, that's for sure. There are other oh, states. It's nice to know Ford is doing something well. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for not having answered your question. We can certainly get you more on that. It's, yeah, it's a little I, I think we genuinely here. appreciate yeah. knowing the good experiences. We are clear on the ones you're unhappy okay. with. Okay. So I just thought of my question. Yes. So the Supreme Court, I don't know if you were here when we first started. And when we just, when we did the law, I think our intention was that if a an agency, and it may have been the wrong decision to make, but I believe the intention was that if an agency or department or whoever has to spend a lot of time preparing, then they could charge for that time. And there was a very specific um, uh, chart of what they could charge and who, at what level, they could charge for different, um, different. Uh, what are those things called grades mm -hmm. um, in the employee system? But the apparently we just hooked that to copying, which was the Supreme Court, right? The, just the decision. Oh, that was, was the decision. Yeah. So what we heard from a couple agencies the other day was, I think, was that when somebody asks for copies, they charge for that backroom time and then they charge for the copying. When somebody asks to re review or inspect, even if they have to do the same backroom time, they don't charge for that. So my question to you is, does that make sense? Or would we just not charge for the backroom time, whether you're inspecting or taking a picture or copying? I think uh, we, we support the Supreme Court decision and. and we think that should be the, the, the law and the policy. So if you're if you're spending backroom time preparing something and then so, and then somebody asks you for five pages of copies, you can charge for that backroom time. But if they say I want to just review it, or yeah, we then, might do that right to inspect the public records. Yes. Yeah. But you would still charge for the backroom time for the, that. I don't, we should. Uh, we believe again. We believe in the Doyle decision. We believe we shouldn't have to uh, have to pay to inspect records. I think. I don't think that was. The, I, I misunderstood the Doyle decision. That I, my understanding of the Doyle decision was that you could pay. They could charge for anybody who wants to copy, not just for the copy itself, but for the back. For the um, time. For the prep time. Behind the scenes. Uh, again, I, I think we should have yeah, open inspection. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, I was just going to keep asking my yeah, questions. I, I, just, I need to be able to, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you um, for being willing to listen to us. We really appreciate that. Thanks, right. Mark. And we'd love, and we'd love your no, follow-up. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So, Anne, are you okay. going to testify today? I am. You are? Okay. Yes. It's a ride Sorry, the time. time. We're oh, about good. to auction off your seat. Oh, excellent. Raise the money for the state to pay for all that public Oh, practice. yes. Mm -hmm. So I have some handouts for you all, and um, I'd be glad to speak and answer that question. So. Yes. I, that that seems I, to be the burning question of the hours. So. I guess I didn't say it very well. No, you did. Oh. You said it 
think you expressed it perfectly well. Um, and we have enough. And yeah. Then, uh, Here's one. So that's my testimony. Oh, wait, I need one copy to read from. <laughs> one from Gail and one from Christopher. Okay. And then um, I'm also passing out uh, the Reporters Committee for the Freedom of the Press um, has drafted some sample legislation that um, they've suggested that you all consider. It's quite different probably than what you're already looking at. Um, and the Reporters Committee could not be here today because they are busy um, dealing with First Amendment violations in the Senate having to do with the impeachment uh, trial right now. So um, I had hoped to get someone up from New York. Um, and it's possible that they might be able to come another day. And I don't know that you know you would consider that, but um, well, we're, we would. I've okay. been doing this for a while. All right. Well, you know, as soon as I can um, muster someone uh, from New York, I certainly will. But they were awfully busy with the impeachment trial this week. So um, I um, am just going to read briefly from my testimony. I know that you could uh, read it yourselves, but. Um, I'm going to intone a few minutes here. Um, you know, I, I think that it's really important for us to think about um, what the Supreme Court decided and why they decided what they did. Um, in Doyle versus Burlington Police Department, the Vermont Supreme Court has clearly stated that the law does not allow government to charge for public inspection of records. The ruling has the force of law. No charge for inspecting records or for making your copies or scans using a cell phone or other device. I quote my colleague, Tom Kearney, editor of the Stowe Reporter, when I say, it's outrageous that Attorney General T.J. Donovan, the state government's top lawyer, is refusing to accept a ruling by the Vermont Supreme Court. Kearney goes on to say in an editorial that B.T. Digger, the Stowe Reporter, and its affiliates in Chittenden County and, and Memorial Counties are publishing that the court ruling confirmed that people have a right to inspect records for free and then went further. They can make their own copies, photos, or scans without paying a fee. If you want the public agency to make copies for you, then you have to pay for those copies. But there is no charge for inspecting records or for making your own copies or scans. The reason for this? Fees limit access to records taxpayers have already paid for. Most fees are related to government attorneys redacting documents. In the case of the EB-5 scandal, for example, the Vermont Attorney General's Office at one point asked for $200,000 for records. Each organization, the Vermont Journalism Alliance, has faced tens of thousands of dollars in fees simply to find out the truth about what government workers who are supportive of the taxpayer dollars have been doing on behalf of the public. When government hides, real people suffer. People have suffered abuses at the hands of state government, and over and over again, the Vermont Attorney General's response is to block access to records regardless. The result? Corruption in state government continues unabated. By withholding records, the Vermont Attorney General has not enabled state actors to perpetrate cover-ups and crimes. Let me give you an example, the recent revelations of prison, prison misconduct. Donovan knew about abuses at the women's prison, Chittenden Regional Correctional Facility, in May of 2017, according to Seven Days, and yet did nothing to stop it. In fact, Donovan has helped to cover up abuses by signing off on settlements and turning a blind eye to the underlying causes of the case. In addition, Donovan has fought VT Digger for 16 months over records pertaining to alleged misconduct involving a former superintendent of the women's prison and Southern State Correctional Facility. If the Edward Adams records had been released in September of 2018, reforms of the prison system could have been expedited by the legislature a year ago, resulting in fewer people, correctional officers and inmates, suffering abuse and sexual harassment, as detailed in the expose recently published by Seven Days. That disclosure would have been a significant step toward protecting the right of inmates and workers to a safe environment and would have likely led to critical reforms 12 months prior that would have prevented more harm and initiated an immediate benefit to the public and the correctional system. Instead, T.J. Donovan tolerated the misconduct and put the protection of misbehaving state workers ahead of the safety of inmates and guards and the public's right to know. 
Instead, Donovan spent taxpayer dollars fighting V.T. Digger in court over the Edward Adams records. And what did we fight over? A Vaughn index. That's a fancy word for a list of records pertaining to a records request and a citation of the exemptions the Vermont Attorney General's Office was using to block those records. Did you know that the definition of a Vaughn index is built into the Public Records Act? Under state statute, government must release a list of all the records responsive to a request. Instead, Donovan forced us to relitigate a fundamental tenet of state statute. This is a pattern that has been repeated over and over again by the Vermont Attorney General's Office in response to requests. There were ongoing delays. Donovan's staff began to make bogus arguments in court. Ultimately, it took us 10 months to get a Vaughn index. It was only released after the seven days story came out and we asked Mike Smith, the secretary of the Agency of Human Services, for the listing. The fight isn't over. The AG's office did a 180 on this issue, finally. And now the Vermont State Employees Association is, is, is moving to intervene. If you read Digger this morning, we had a story about that. The jury is out on when we will learn the truth about what misconduct Adams may have been involved in for years both at Chittenden and Southern State, contributing to a culture of abuse, drug use, and humiliation of inmates and correctional officers. The Vermont Attorney General, General's Office has fought VT Digger with tax taxpayer dollars for documents that were created with taxpayer dollars. Meanwhile, VT Digger has incurred thousands in legal fees, fees so far on this one case with no end in sight. Now let's talk about EB-5. More than 550 local vendors and contractors were out $12 million during the state cover-up of this scandal. Donovan has fought the release of EB-5 records tooth and nail. Here, too, Vermonters have directly suffered, in this case, business owners and workers. For three years, 42 contractors were owed more than $7 million for work performed at Burke Mountain Resort and Jay Peak. About $5 million was owed to 513 vendors in the Northeast Kingdom. VT Digger heard from contractors and vendors who weren't getting paid, but could get no information from the state. In the interest of helping Vermont business people, investors, and the public at large better understand what was going on, we requested records pertaining to the state's role in the fraud in June 2015, 10 months before lawsuits were filed against the developers. The request was ignored for four months before it was denied. We appealed and received 30 pages of correspondence between state officials and a principal of the JP projects. At one point, as we continued to push for state records, the Vermont Attorney General's office told us we would need to commit to $200,000 in cash in advance before they would begin the, begin the process of redacting the records. If I sound a little upset, I am. That's a good portion of our annual budget. Why were we determined to get the records? Because the state of Vermont, including Governor Peter Shumlin, the Commerce Agency and employees of the Vermont EB-5 Regional Center, knew in the summer of 2014 about the JP fraud, and yet that kept that information under wraps from contractors and vendors who continued to provide services to the developers, wholly unaware that they would likely suffer in the process. It wasn't until April 2017 that vendors and contractors got their money back. In the interim, local companies begged banks for extended lines of credit, shed workers, or went out of business altogether. I'm not going to get into JP. You all know the story. BT Digger has sued over records twice in the EB case. An immediation last summer learned through a third party investigation paid for by the state. The four months of records involving James Candido, a former regional center director, are missing. Donovan's denial of records, using expansive interpretation of the relevant litigation exemption, is perpetuating a state cover-up of illegal, illegal activity at J.P. Resort. Four and a half years after placing that first public records request, V.T. Digger still has not obtained access to documents that would show whether officials in the EB-5 program were grossly negligent in their handling of J.P. In an editorial, my colleague Tom Kearney wrote a summary of the Ron EB-5 records saga that I quote here. Fees have become a significant obstacle to reviewing Vermont's public records. Increasingly, agencies have been charging huge, huge fees, thousands of dollars, to cover staffing costs to prepare records for public viewing. 
Exhibit A is VT Digger, which fought a lonely battle to prove that the JP EB5 expansion projects were a fraud. A fraud indeed. Millions of investors' dollars were swindled. The chief architect of the scam went to jail and had to forfeit 81 million. He hasn't gone to jail yet. That's a mistake, Tom. <laughs> and the federal government shut down the Vermont EB5 Regional Center for utter incompetence. All this has emerged from VT Digger's reporting. When the facts finally started to emerge, you'd think the Attorney General's office would have smelled the rat and investigated what happened. It didn't. Rather, it was federal officials who pursued the details about the scandal that occurred right under the noses of Vermont's most prominent politicians. And now, after years of foot dragging, the state says some crucial records have vanished. With that grim record involving state documents, you'd think the state's top legal officer would try to make amends. You'd think that the state government might feel a sense of shame. You'd think the state would try to restore public confidence and make it easier for people to see what their government is doing in their name. But to the contrary, Donovan not only has the gall to defy the Supreme Court, he's lobbying the legislature to enact fees for viewing and copying public records. Access to public records should not be an issue at all. They're the public's records, and they should be managed for the public. Most public agencies in Vermont already do it. And since most public records are electronic, it's easy to store them properly. All it requires is good management. And in answer to the question that you asked earlier, Jeanette, about um, the fact that records have to be prepared, yeah, I, I would argue, service. no, no, I think, you know, you're making a fair point. I, I think that the issue is that records, as they are being properly managed and stored, should be redacted as required under the law, you know, before, the, before they're filed. So if you have personal information in a document that you know is going to be requested, any enforcement action, any agreement, such as the one in the Edward, Edward Adams case, should be redacted before it's filed, based on exemptions existing in the law. So the, the, the work needs to be done on the front end, and then when people ask to inspect, they ought to be able to inspect for free. If government hasn't done its job in advance, that's not our problem. I, I, I agree with that, and I don't, would you, would you have to, in some cases, keep two copies uh, because you can't redact it's not on us that that's for no no no, no I, but your suggestion uh, has but the suggestion about redacting first before it's filed uh, i mean then i think that with um okay. with good records management and and um electronic systems now it should be much easier to to be able to do that but uh, to, yeah the, 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 the main point yeah. i'm trying to make with my testimony here is that when you're talking about the cost of records, that is peanuts compared to what this has cost the public. Yeah. The harm this has done to real people. And I want you to think about that. That's my point. Because the people of Vermont are more important than state workers. Oh, no, I wasn't. I'm not, you're not, I know that's not what you're saying. But I'm saying that when we trivialize this by talking about the cost of redaction, the cost of preparing records, when there's been real human cost here, I want you all to think about that. That's the point of my testimony. So your answer to my question earlier is there should be no cost to the preparation and redaction, whether you are copying or inspecting. Sure. No, you can charge for copies. No, for, uh, but you I can't didn't charge that. for inspection. No, I know, but, right. but for the, the cost of, if there's a cost of preparing, the preparation. that should no. not be borne by either the copier or the inspector. Correct. All right, okay, great. That was, yes, because I understand from some agencies that they charge <clears throat> if the preparation time if somebody wants a copy, but not if they just want to inspect. So it depends so on, I mean, there are many nuances to this. We've been charged many different things over time for different things that people have done. You know, whether it's, you know, uh, redact, attorneys redacting records, or we've been, people tried to charge us for collecting records. And I've, I've tried to balk at all those things because I think it should all be free, frankly. Um, I, I hate the idea of paying a lawyer to take away information that 
you know, may or may not be valid to exempt. That's why I'm suggesting that this should be done before there's a question raised. If, if public officials are really responsible in the way they deal with records, they should be redacting them as they're filing them. And then when we make the request, it's simply a matter of either paying for copies or going in and seeing the documents for free. So I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mark, which was before you got in here. Yes, yeah, sorry, I missed uh, that. That's okay. Um, what What's the best experience of, of, of obtaining public records you've experienced in state in Vermont? Well, I can give you a really good example that happened today. I mean, it does happen. Yeah, that's and, and, so typica and typically we get records easily when there's no controversy. So, for example, uh, on Tuesday we had the budget address, and a bunch of us were there. We went to the briefing, the budget briefing on the fifth floor. And um, Suzanne Young talked about a document that they had created that described the climate change expenditures that the administration has made over the past two years. And naturally, we're journalists, we said, oh, can we have a copy of that? And uh, Suzanne said, yes, but then, of course, we didn't get it right away. <laughs> it was the next day, but that's pretty good. And uh, so I got a copy that was unredacted, and, and uh, Bob's your uncle. I had the document. It's great. It was easy. She had it on file, and she sent it to me. Do you always no have that experience? No big deal. Do you always have that experience from the governor's office? Uh, no, not always. So, but I mean, what you know, age? And so, uh, are there dependent. agencies that are better than others? The yeah, Secretary or departments. State's office is, is the best. What, sorry, wait. Secretary of State's office. Well, they should be. They should be. <laughs> and does that include archives? Uh, yeah, archives has been fine. They've been good. Because as we look for a best, mm -hmm. a, a best model yep. to roll out throughout yep. state government, that is what mm -hmm. I think we're also I would, trying I, to figure I out. I think they've set the standard. Yeah, great. I think they've set the standard, and there, and you know, it depends on what we're asking for. But I can tell you that um, dollars of donuts, if there's any kind of concern uh, or potential embarrassment or controversy, mm -hmm. it is a blessed fight to get the records. It doesn't matter what department it is, and that's not the way it should be. Mm -hmm. It, we should just be getting these records because the public has a right to know it's really going on in government because the fact of the matter is we don't we can't have faith in you people if we don't know what you're doing you you're people part of us I mean yeah, we're all like government it's all, of us. Yeah. it's all of us and so when you right when you're so but tough on state it, employees they're us too I mean uh, they're all yeah but they're not us if we don't get the records and we don't know what's really going on right. then it becomes us and them then it becomes a right well uh, my other part of my question is I'm assuming, because as you know, we had TJ uh, testify last week, and uh, I assume that the attorney-client privilege, which he actually spoke quite eloquently about, uh, is one of the exemptions, that one of the 263 exemptions, because otherwise all court document, you know, there are public documents that, I mean. I don't think that's an exemption. I think that's part of the... Of a different is law. that an exemption is my question because that you know I, I'm the wife of a lawyer and the mother of a lawyer and you know that's a sacred privilege is protected information attorney client and some of what I mean I know there's a difference of opinion here but is that one of the exemptions that is honored in those exemptions I assume it is it has to be you right? haven't read the law I, I yeah I, it's in there of the 263, I wasn't on this committee when we did that. Read the exemptions. It's yeah, we there. should. We haven't. I, I'm yeah, I'd suggest you read them. It's in there. Yep. Since you're changing, you might want to read it. Yeah. Attorney clients in there. Right. And then I think we also just quite. I mean, one of the issues from the attorney general's office, and you know, I know you're not going to have any sympathy for this, but it is one that. You know, we hear is the is, and I agree with you. It is the cost of doing business as as a government that it should be all public record. But it is, there is a huge range in the cost to government, uh, in terms of lawyers' time, staff time. Yeah, I don't have any sympathy. Yeah, I know you don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? I'm not sure I do anymore either. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that this is a little bit nitpicky, and mm -hmm. uh, I mean, gets a little bit more into the weeds in terms of, um, but we have to come up with some, we're going to come up with something, right. so we need Yeah, I recommend the reporters committee's uh, um, uh, suggested I'll, language. I'll look at that, but I have right. two questions that aren't, wouldn't be addressed in there, I believe. One is, 
um, if you could talk a little bit more about, um, and I'm not, I think they're called confidential agreements with employees. And then if you could, we have a bill in here that would extend um, public records access to nonprofits that are created by, funded by, and doing business for, that that, that is their role. Vital was one, and there are a couple other ones in here, and we have a bill that would extend the public records law to those also, and I wonder if you can comment on those two things. I don't have any comment on either issue. Okay. All right. I mean, I, I'm just here to talk about our end of it. Okay. I'm not here to make recommendations or okay. comment on anything else. Okay. We did bring some recommendations. Okay. That's you. that's not my recommendation. That's the reporters' committee's recommendation yeah. for legislation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very back. much. Thank you very much. Matt. Hello. Um, I do have some remarks. Say I was a little nervous about coming to testify today. It's not something I've done before, but it's the only way I can get a seat. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's, that's one that's good reason to testify. Of being on the committee. That hasn't guaranteed Scott a seat. Okay. <laughs> uh, so good afternoon. I'm going to read from these remarks and then say a few other things. But I'm the news editor of Seven Days, Matthew Ryan. And here as part of the Vermont Journalism Alliance, which has been described to you. Um, I, I do think that some people have the impression that it's easy and inexpensive to obtain public records currently. Um, and I'd like to explain how time consuming and costly it actually can be. Uh, as described earlier, often we wind up paying fees for staff to produce records and prepare them for production. What that often means is we're paying for somebody else's attorney to redact documents, blacking out, in my experience, often page after page after page, based on the other de determination, the information is covered by one of the myriad exemptions to the public records law. For some, the rule of thumb seems to be, if in doubt, black it out. If we disagree with their decision, and we don't know what's being redacted, we don't know what's being withheld, our only recourse is to appeal to that same agency, to ask them to take another look. And if we still don't like the no, then our only request is to hire a lawyer and sue. Records cases can be very expensive, I know. Um, seven days had the audacity to ask for records when a public school administrator left his job in 2018. As a result of that request, the school district we sought records from sued the newspaper. We eventually won the Vermont Supreme Court, but we're out $7,500 in legal costs. News organizations that request records are often told the data will cost thousands of dollars. Journalists often get the impression that the cost estimates are meant to discourage them from pursuing the records at all. In any event, it's not uncommon for news agencies to consider paring down records requests in order to make them affordable. Here's an example, uh, a, a real life example of how the process can go. Last year, Seven Days and Vermont Public Radio teamed up for our first ever collaboration. It was a series of articles and reports called Worse for Care. We joined forces for a number of reasons, but one was simply to split the high cost of obtaining the public records that we needed to report these stories. It started when Seven Days decided to look into elder care homes regulated by the Department of Aging and Independent Living. We asked the state for five years' worth of data regarding any complaints. This started months of negotiations. For various reasons, price estimates fluctuated from $1,600 to $2,300 for those records. We ultimately paid $1,600. Have you ever got to buy something and you couldn't get a price? That's what it's like trying to get records. After getting the initial records, we asked for additional ones, disclosing simply the fines that had been imposed on homes during that period. We were told that in order to produce that information, Dale would have to review five years' worth of correspondence with more than 130 facilities, that that would take somebody a full work week, 40 hours, that they'd bill us 57, 57 cents a minute, or roughly $1,400. 
after we protested, the state said a worker could do the job in six hours. We ultimately paid about $200. In that instance, uh, it turned out only a handful of facilities had actually been fined. So we paid a lot for very little data. And we did that because the state did not have the information stored in a manner that made it convenient to retrieve. We use these public records to reveal systemic problems of abuse and neglect that have, that have occurred at many of Vermont's elder care homes. We found instances where homes failed to run the appropriate background checks on their staff. We found uh, medication errors. We found problems with the uh, diets that people were on. We found homes that prevented people with dementia from wandering off. We found instances that led to injury and death. And we used the records to build a database that we made public so that for the first time, people can go online, look at a home, see what the inspectors have found over years, and see where it stands in comparison with comparable facilities. Seven, seven Days in VPR are two of the state's healthy news organizations. It's hard to imagine, though, that many small Vermont newspapers and new news organizations would be able to afford such expenses. And I, I want to go off my script here for a minute. Um, Senator, you mentioned the Shield Law. And um, some years ago, I was at work, we were putting together an issue when a state police investigator came in and asked us uh, for notebooks and notes related to some stories we'd done. And, um, we declined to turn them over, and we soon realized that Vermont had no shield law. And we're very great. I'm one of the people who was subpoenaed, and I'm very grateful for the work that the legislature did to address this shortcoming and to stand up for press freedom. Um, I believe that um, in an era where I, I don't think I need to explain to people in this room that the press is not as, uh, you know, has been disrupted by the internet. The business models uh, mean that the Burlington Free Press and others are no longer printing money. Um, and this is another opportunity to recognize that having to, having to uh, it's another opportunity to stand up and say, hey, we're going to stand with the media on this. Um, it, it's been said, the rest of this has been said, these, are, these records are, of course, the public's. Um, Maintaining these complex, sex, complex sets of documents in an organized, searchable, and readily available format is, in this day and age, a basic function of government. Nobody should be told it'll take 1400 cost $1,400 to produce, produce a handful of records. Um, charging high fees for viewing and preparing these documents will, in many instances, and does, effectively lock it away. It's obviously not in the public interest. Vermonters want to know the basis for public officials' decisions, and they want to know about the conditions that state inspectors found in the elder care homes that they entrust with the care of their mother. So I'm going to ask you the same question about, and it's, it's, it's hard to ask um, specific weedy questions after you and Ann and Mark give a, give kind of a broad. Um, sure. But I'm going to anyway because we have to deal with the weeds. So the suggested language that's, that came from the reporters, what's it called? Committee for the Freedom of the Press. Committee for the Freedom of the Press. Um, says that an agency may not charge or collect the cost staff of staff time spent in complying with a request to inspect public records. And then there's more down here about being able to use your own equipment to inspect the records. So my question is, what we heard last week, I think, when we did this, is that some agencies charge that preparation time if you're going to copy it, but they don't charge the preparation time if you're going to inspect it. Should we? Should it be a blanket rule that they don't charge for the preparation time period, whether you're going to copy or inspect, and just make co just charge for the actual copy that's made? I think make, uh, just charging for the copy that's made would be ideal. 
That's, so if, that's my opinion. So if we did something like this, we would change this language to make it clear that whether you're copying or inspecting, there's no charge for the right. The in my opinion, in my opinion, uh, the the fewer fees there are, yeah. the better. Do you know our state archivist? I do, okay. and you were, you were asking earlier about good examples, and I had a very good. I example. was asking about. Good I'm examples. sorry, I had a very good example with the state archivist, and good. Um, I've had other good examples as well. But good. Unfortunately, well, a lot of bad ones. We're looking and for we, best practice here, mm -hmm. and we we do have within our capability the. I mean, we can tell we at one point told agencies that they had to com start complying with the the um the timing and some of the records management and i think we can be more more forceful about that can i uh, say one thing yeah uh, tanya marshall state archivist for the record uh, last week when i testified i did offer if you wanted to know the legislative intent yeah. behind what each of that because what you just just described was the original 1976 act copying the actual cost of the copy because everything else was to be assumed as being yeah. part of the normal course of business. I'm happy to testify again if you want to know what changed in 1996 and what was the context of that particular adding staff time and what was intended. Okay. If you want, you can just let me know and I'm happy to bring that forward. Okay. But the original was not to. The original has always been, and then the next layer of um, staff time, just for yep. context, was based on the advent of additional systems and concerns about how to make reports out of data. So when you actually read it within context of 1996 and the testimony, you're going to see it's very different than conceptually what is being talked about here in 2020. Okay. All right. Any questions for that? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess. So I go back to uh, the, eight, the days when the news reporter, we still had telephone booths, would get a scoop and would run like heck to the, the and call back to whatever organization it was. And obviously that's changed today with the digital world. What would be a reasonable amount of time for an agency to have been able to give you a record that you've requested? That's a really good question. And I'll tell you why it's important. Because if you decide it's three days, then it will take three days. If you decide it's five days, it will take five days. And if you decide it's six months, it will take them six months to produce that record. Um, we find time and time again that agencies take too long. Um, agencies invoke the extension allowed in the law, the 10-day mm -hmm. extension, and then still go beyond it. I have a situation right now um, that I really can't elaborate on, but these these things are commonplace. Mm -hmm. So I think for recognize now that what is it? You, you have a, they have a few days now, and then they have ten. Day, they can invoke an extension. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's certainly adequate for them to do their jobs. Yeah. Um, I, it has been my experience that they often fail to do their jobs within that period regardless and then again once again we're in the position of well we can sue and i talked to a lawyer about an option of, of filing a suit for that reason recently and he told me he had won a case uh that, and it took four years okay <laughs> any more questions yeah. thank you thank you thank you are you Jay? I am. Okay. I apologize for. No, 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 that's okay. You came in. I didn't know who you were, so I figured maybe that's who you were. I do. Well, thank you okay. very much. Yeah, the least known person. He must be the guy. It's like the game of Clue. I did it with the candlestick. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and and Thanks, Frank. everybody knows that this, this committee takes this issue very seriously. I mean, we, we really, we really do. We've taken it seriously in the past and not gotten it right. We've taken it seriously. We're taking it seriously now. I think that. Well, well uh, so for the record, uh, my name is Jay Barton. I'm the uh, Vice President General Manager of WCAX-TV. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be in your presence and speak on this topic. 
Um, mercifully, from your perspective, I do not have prepared notes, which means I will go quickly. Uh, and that then doesn't you, always mean That's true. Well, if you know me, that's right. It doesn't always mean it will go quickly. However, I will do my best. Um, I think that uh, my comrades at arms, uh, when it comes to defending journalism, have said, have come at this from a variety of angles that are all very uh, poignant and uh, important perspectives. I wanted to step back one step and, and also thank you for the thoughtfulness of the questions um, around the table because I can tell that you are taking this seriously and, and, uh, and I think that we have a real opportunity um, because all of us, you know, a lot of the conversation has been posed in an us versus them sort of uh, dyad where, you know, I'm the good guy, someone else is the bad guy, or vice versa. And perhaps we have the opportunity for it not necessarily to be that way. I have sensed, uh, just in listening, that, that there may be a third way, a way where, for instance, maybe the perspective, the perspective in 1976 might have been that the expectation of the government is to be responsible to its people, because the power of a government is derived by a mandate from the masses no longer by some divine intervention or a king or a prince, even Prince Harry. None of those folks are able to, to, to uh, they don't hand us power, we the people hand power to the government. And so the government, in measure, takes a responsibility back to those people. You know, I think about on our flag, freedom and unity. Freedom means that uh, I'm responsible for myself. No one else will stand for me, I will stand for my choices and be held responsible. Unity means we're responsible to each other. And uh, isn't that a joy? So as I listen to this conversation and I think about the opportunities um, that have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to a variety of different uh, organizations, perhaps including mine from time to time, um, you know, if the original intent, if the spirit was a cost of doing business of the government in order for it to be responsible to its people is to uh, understand that uh, rather than using the fees as a shield to protect information that perhaps I'm embarrassed by and a sword to pierce the person asking, um, because you know when you say when you hear testimony that says, well I asked for something and they had no problem giving it to me so I got it the next day. I asked for something else and they were nervous that it might be costly in some fashion and suddenly it took six months and thirty thousand dollars worth of, of uh, legal fees that's using that's using the law as a, as a shield and a sword against the people rather than for them and uh, so I, I since this opportunity for us to perhaps uh, as a body think on this from the perspective of maybe it's just a change rather than saying how do we deal with fees maybe it's how do we deal with the perspective of our responsibility to the people? Uh, how do we deal with, maybe that's what this um, addressing of this issue could become. And so uh, what that would mean then, and I think some of these great questions, and I, I do have to also apologize as a manager, that means I don't know a whole lot, but I do, um, I'm standing in for Roger Garrity, our news director, who is very, um, well versed in this topic and, and the minutia of what has uh, transpired in our newsroom. So I, I, I regret that I don't have just personally at hand an example, but just in listening to the way people have referred to the way our archives are being run, perhaps a model like that is the one where we change the expectation. You know, the built in belief is. You know, why does it cost money for back office hours to pr to present a document? Could it be because we don't expect to have to present the document? Could not then we just change the perspective? You expect to present the document, and for that reason, you know it's easier to lift a grain of sand than it is to lift uh, than it is to lift a, a palace of glass. So so in this case, if I take each document in turn, and we have a system statewide that. Uh, manages these documents up front one at a time or batch at a time, then it, will, then it removes those barriers. 
when the time comes for the document to be produced because the expectation is now that the document will be produced as opposed to not. And so that would be sort of my testimony. Again, um, I always joke about being in management. That just means I'm in your way. But uh, at some level, when you think about managing people, an organization, an issue, all those things are matters uh, to some degree of perspective. And so my layering on might be, what if our perspective was we expect to give these documents not to WCAX, not to Seven Days, not to BT Digger, not to whomever uh, in the media. We, th this isn't something where, while the media has a very strong perspective on it because we intersect with it so often. Like you said, we're running to the phone booth. Um, we think about it from the perspective of the person who doesn't have an organization. They, 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 uh, I, I saw a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Day where, and I'm paraphrasing Dr. King, but he said something to the effect of, it's an insult to a man to tell him to pull himself up by his bootstraps when you know he doesn't have boots, right? That's a paraphrase, but it's a pretty good quote regardless. And uh, I think that this is an opportunity to say to the person who's not got an organization, but they have a question of the government who is responsible to them. The government has expected to help that person have some boots. So that's what I have to say. And I'm beating you up now, please. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. They, they did a good job, so I, I get to just well, be I here. I appreciate you coming down. I, I, do, I do appreciate the work of, of the thoughtfulness of this committee in <coughs> dealing with it because uh, any decision can have unintended consequences. So we would hope that they be good ones. And in this case, as um, my comrades have said, I think that for any person, not a media organization, but for any citizen, um, the idea that I can inspect the files created by the government the idea that I can, these are public records created and maintained with public money, ergo, theoretically, I have some ownership of them. The expectation should be that I have access to them. I think that might be a reasonable starting position. So, Thanks. Thank you Thanks, very Jim. much. Thank, Thank you for you. the Thank opportunity. You. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the privilege to stand sit before you today and uh, testify. Uh, my name is Scott Woodward. I am a select board member in the town of Pomfret, uh, and I have served in local government for the past eight years. First as uh, planning commission member, and more recently on the select board. I, I'd like to, uh, I submitted written testimony, but I'll just yeah. speak to that testimony. Yeah. Um, I'd like to offer a local government perspective as someone who is often has to respond to uh, public records requests. Uh, first, I'd say off the bat that from a, from a policy standpoint, I stand on the side of if, if there's no need to charge, we shouldn't charge, even for preparation. But if, if the legislature in this committee is thinking about legislation that might charge, there's a few things that would be worth taking into consideration. And my, my main point is that there needs to be that ability to distinguish between what is true preparation versus what is really inefficient record keeping practices. Um, and having served in local government for as long as I have, I can say that while we do our best, we're not great at records management. We could do much better. Um, and I highlighted a couple of examples in my testimony. I'll speak to one of them right now. Um, we received, the select board received the public records request uh, last year for basically, and this happens frequently, where curious people want to know what's going on. And email is a, is a favorite uh, subject. So we were asked for all five select board members' email for a very long period of time, every single email. And so uh, the scenario was we all manage our email differently. Some people use a client on their laptop, some people are on Windows, some people are on Mac, some people use the cloud, but you've got five members who potentially manage their email in very different ways. 
And it quickly became a, how the heck are we gonna get our email off of our machines or out of the cloud to this person who's requested our messages? And we basically huddled up, put ourselves in a room for about three hours, and we went one by one through our machines and basically extracted the email out. But it took us three hours multiplied by five people. And if we had charged for that time, um, it would have come to a bill of about $270, which is, you know, it's not huge, but that's a lot for an individual person requesting uh, records. And that, uh, in my mind, a lot of, in fact, probably the entire or most of the three hours per person that we spent could have been avoided if we had some standardized, routine way of managing email and in some uh, simple way to actually pull email off of the machines or the cloud, some practice in place. So I think it's really important for uh, the committee to, as it's drafting legislation, to think about uh, how do you distinguish between what is true preparation versus making up for better you know, or less than, than you know, stellar record keeping practices. And I, just to give a nod to Tanya, uh, the state archivist, state archivist does set the standard. And the, the records retention policies that are available through the Secretary of State's site, website are actually a good yardstick. Uh, because as I suggested in my testimony, if there's uh, a possibility to charge for preparation, maybe uh, the legislature might require adoption of records retention schedules. Uh, and adherence to those schedules, because that would signify better practice, better, better records management practices. And um, maybe also to, there might be an audit process that could be incorporated, or some self uh, audit whereby uh, the public or some external organization can evaluate whether record keeping practices are up to some level uh, that would help distinguish between what's true preparation versus poor practices. Um, and you know, I can recite a number of examples over the past eight years where, um, in my mind, uh, we've had to figure out and come up with public records, but most of the effort was really just because, uh, yet another example is somebody might ask for a single PDF file, um, but who knows who has it? It might be on one person's laptop or it might be in a file cabinet somewhere. And oftentimes we don't even know where the, the true record lies. So there, you know, that's, that's really the main point um, is to figure out how to distinguish between um, record keeping practices versus um, you know, uh, poor record keeping practices and what's true preparation. So I liked your idea, if I understood it, that if an agency is going to charge for preparation, they first have to be in compliance with the record keeping system that is right now encouraged but not right. required. And I, we, we could do that for state agencies and departments. Should we also do it for the municipalities? We have 250 of them. Would they be in here? jumping down our throats? I, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I am not sure about that because I think more and more municipalities are using technology mm -hmm. to their advantage. So I don't, I think it's, um, it's an evolutionary process for municipalities, okay. but I, I think some might, uh, might not love it, but I think some may embrace it actually. And eventually maybe everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think the league, we haven't really talked to the league about this, but it's it, it's increasingly going to be a municipal issue. Just, uh, you know, individuals will be asking for public records right. of their select boards, of their commissions, and I would dare say most of them are not equipped to respond in any kind of timely fashion. Right. I mean, I would say in the grand scheme of things, most municipalities in Vermont are in this point as they're transitioning more to electronic document management, but a lot are not there yet. Well, we have and so few, I mean, many, many towns don't have professional don't have staff any, running right, the town. I mean, right. not every town has a town manager or right. professional administrators. But basically what I was suggesting is if 
a municipality were allowed to charge for preparation, they would first have to establish that they've got some level of record keeping practices in place. Um, That's interesting. So, and, and then, you know, this might be, as I mentioned, the last bullet point in my testimony is, uh, it might be an opportunity to encourage, uh, you know, not, not a stick approach, but more of a carrot approach of how do you entice local government to move more toward e-government. Because uh, the reality is that's where we're going. And just two examples to illustrate that point. Some towns today already provide their grand list uh, through the website. A lot don't. But I know a lot of uh, residents who would love to be able to just go to the town website and be able to look up their, their lister sheet. Um, but some towns are embracing that. And uh, Jericho, I think, is one example where you can go to their website and pull up their, their, all their lister cards and available the right on the web. But that's you know, something maybe that the legislature could encourage towns to start moving in that direction. We, I got a lot of pushback when we um, required towns to have their, the minutes of their right. um, meetings and their official meetings up with it for inspection and then when we told them that they had to have it on the website, if they had an active website, they had to have it on within a certain period of time and some of them didn't even have minutes for in paper inspection. I mean, they just didn't have minutes. So it's um, the, the, broad, the broad range of municipalities is going to be a bigger issue, but right. the state agencies, I think that we, we can maybe have a little more control over because there right. shouldn't be a broad range of state agencies like there is from right. a, a town with 300 right. people and a town with 60,000 right. people. But we could also at the same time uh, consider a time frame right. for the towns and, and a carrot to get towns to that point in five years, whatever it is. But it would be great to have a carrot to uh, encourage best practices. You cover local government too. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. Yeah. We're actually piloting for related to the minutes with municipal reports right now. They all come you into are? the Secretary of State's office. They all come into Azure digital archives and we present them out that way. So if that actually works as a good model, we're hoping to expand that system so it can actually accommodate that's other great. records of the municipality. But that's just the select board or trustees minutes, not all the commissions and... Right now we're just starting with municipal reports, the annual report that comes The annual out. report, okay. If I may, one, uh, since you had mentioned it earlier about uh, potentially uh, extending public records law to um, okay. private organizations well, that... Nonprofits that are set up, but, and, and the two right. that were used as examples, there was a lawsuit around Vital, yeah. which is the... Right, yeah. familiar and with then, that. And then the one that's the example that's in the bill here now is the Sustainable um, Ag Fund. What is it? Sustainable, sustainable Jobs Fund Program. Sustainable, sustainable Jobs Fund Program. program. And that's similar analogs exist in local government, too. There are uh, private organizations, nonprofits, that actually perform municipal functions. Uh, so it's actually the same paradigm. Uh -huh. And so I would encourage the committee to think about that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm happy to speak to that another time. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to get into the weeds on it now. But, but there is applicability uh, at the local government as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's the upshot of Thank you. Any more questions we've got? Thank you for coming yeah. on. Thank you for the, for the opportunity. And you know you can watch on our um, our agenda. Um, it's always posted. And um, Gail tries to keep a list of interested parties so that you can just send it out and say we're taking this up. So if you if your name wants to be on there, okay. let her know. And, and then uh, whether you come or just well, know Scott's what's working on a project with the court, so this is it's close by sometimes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Scott. All right. Um, I think we're, wow, we're 10 minutes ahead of ourselves. Doesn't well, anybody have anything more to say? Come on. <laughs> <laughs>
We're never ahead of ourselves. <laughs> um, oh, it's because we're so behind. Clarity and gravity in the journalism. Yes, we got that. OK. Um, so it, we'll take a break. We are coming back here then to talk about the uh, plan to elevate the Department of Public Safety to the Agency of Public Safety. And um, we will look at that when we come back. And I would suggest, since we're 10 minutes ahead of ourselves, can we start a little early? So could we start at like 20 after? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.